morning, everybody, your excellencies, the ladies and gentlemen. Good, good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Marta already listed all the excellencies and authorities, so I would like to mi to skip that. But uh, it's great to go to attend a conference at Christmas time because I believe that Advent expectations uh, are warming everybody's heart, and the messages that. Uh, at today's conference that are very serious and very important uh, stay in our heart in this emotional state even further. So I would like to thank you for the invitation. It's a great privilege, uh, head of office, for me to open this conference because this is basically uh, built, uh, a material uh, built on uh, our uh, children policy of the past 12 years. In 2010, when the National Conservative Party uh, came into power, the focus on its so of its social policy was the family as one of the most important pillars uh, of uh, national uh, survival and society. Our constitution states that the family bond is built on marriage and on the relationship between children and parents. Therefore, uh, Hungary uh, supports uh, children, having children, and you have probably heard and uh, of this, you know this, even in international comparison. Um, we support uh, families up to the extent of 5% of the GDP. If this is a an obstacle, then it should not be. This should be an individual decision with this freedom and with this subsidy, with this help. We support assuming children. And cardinal, that is, in, that is very strict laws reg regulate. Um, our uh, policy, uh, again, at, at the level of constitution, the protection of children with special measures is also regulated. Uh, this, constitution, this constitutional rights is of utmost importance because we Hungarians believe that our children and grandchildren with their talents, per talent, perseverance, and spiritual force can make our millennial state um, great again. So make Hungary great again, to quote a to say a classical quote, so be, we believe in the perseverance of the generations to be, and we also tr strive to help them in each and every field, every walk of life. After this uh, political introduction, uh, please allow me to uh, provide you a professional report, and I would like to apologize to the interpreters in advance. Uh, on the 15th of March 2014, the new civil code came into force, and uh, the uh, family law is also part of it. The uh, independent family law of Hungary is uh, built on, uh, is, is in harmony uh, with the convenience of 1989 in New York, quote, in family relations, the child's interest and rights are of uh, privileged importance. So I would like to em emphasize that the, that the child's interest is present and primary in each and every part of family law, especially, especially um, tutorship, uh, uh, adoption, uh, family rights. Um, in uh, the position of the child has to t be taken into consideration, especially if the child is uh, more than 14 years of age. In the application of law, of course, this always involves further details. Uh, but with a well-harmonized team, I, I'm sure that Commissioner handles this well uh, to the greatest uh, content of um, uh, of the public. Um, the regulation of uh, parental supervision is important. Civil the Civil Code regulates that the parent needs to inform uh, the children of the decisions uh, that affect them, and at the same time, uh, the child uh, that has the ability to act uh, should also have the ability to pronounce its opinion and to take a, jo a joint decision together with uh, the parent. So in Hungarian civil law, the child has a word to say and his or her opinion uh, based on its age and maturity. Uh, can has to be taken into consideration with the uh, relevant weight. Um, and enforcing the opinion of the child is also regulated in different laws. Uh, the civil law the fir on the 1st of August this year had a modification, and this foresees that uh, in any litigation, 
uh, regarding parental supervision, parental custody, the child has, should have the uh, possibility to express its opinion. It's only a possibility and not an obligation. This is important to emphasize. We are in a continuous collaboration with civil organizations and experts dealing with children's rights, uh, with authorities of this kind. The courts are also our partners in this regard so that we can help the application of law. And um, the, the, the minor who has the ability to act and who has to be, the ability to judge, well, this is the biggest challenge to, to applicants of law. So we share each and every good practice and uh, we also encourage courts to do so, uh, so that this can become the, so that this can be the benefit of everybody. I would like to thank all the relevant stakeholders for the extraordinary work that they uh, carry out in order to avoid uh, misunderstandings in each and every legal field. Another very important change is. Uh, the modification of the civil code that came into force on the 1st of January 2022, which, which enlarged the possibilities of parental custody. If the minor's interest, then at the request of one of the parents, the um, joint custody can also be um, 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 announced and, and um, declared by court. This is also a milestone, this is also a very important change which for years has been there at the agenda of several civil organizations. But here again, it was very important that the goodwill of the legislator and the uh, decade-long experience of, uh, of judicial practice should be put, uh, should be put into practice and uh, application of law should be carried out with the best goodwill. And this was also able to be integrated into Hungarian law without any problems. And I would also like to thank Zsuzsa's work in this regard for having been in a act very active uh, dialogue with all stakeholders. As a minister, as a mother of three, I believe that if we can contribute to uh, the life of families Im improving and getting better even in times of conflict, then uh, on the side of uh, legal application, we try to provide possibilities um, that, um, are, that offer a good solution. Uh, Child-friendly uh, legal application also means that special uh, rules have been uh, ab applied. In the, a minor has, uh, is, uh, can be heard in a courtroom if he or she requests to do so. And uh, otherwise, a child-friendly device has to be used. I wonder what this looks like, where, where, which even the the uh, smallest one. Uh, are familiar with and then are uh, are okay with um, civil institutions dealing with um, children's rights also offer a warmer friendlier environment for all the victims of family and child abuse and and so on it's also, it is also very important to highlight that in family law cases if there is no request the uh, even if uh, there is no request, the court can decide on parental custody and on uh, temporary um, parental custody. And at the same time, a specialized uh, psychologist uh, can be involved to listen to and to examine both parents and child in family law cases. And, and uh, thereby, I would also like to thank for all the family law group working in the framework of the ministry for uh, to all the partners many of whom are present here thank you very much for coming and uh, uh, to Zsuzsa also uh, for uh, monitoring both uh, the profession and the application of law and try to come up with um, viable solutions feasible solutions we are on a ground where we cannot be uh, we cannot achieve 100% success, but uh, whoever is in this room is of good will, has good intentions, you uh, know, in, uh, in order to solve an, um, a matter of utmost importance. I believe that in the past two to three years, we managed to create this very uh, constructive atmosphere, even if um, certain uh, members of the group do not agree with the policies of the National Conservative Party. But uh, if we talk about um, making 
uh, litigation case is more efficient. I, I believe that this is a, a very important. As for transborder, transnational uh, family law cases, what I would like to highlight, and this is again based on experience. Uh, so currently, the Hungarian Hungarian law already enables that. Uh, the uh, Hungarian court saw a foreign law uh, decision um, deciding for the immediate return of a child that has been taken illegally to Hungary does not have to be executed immediately because very many factors can, can affect the life of a child. It's also very important to add. So this also uh, provides uh, other a means in the hands of a judge in order to take a wise and fair decision. Uh, as for the, um, uh, there, there is a 40 l level uh, signaling that a child is in danger. This is local, uh, county, regional, and national level. And the collaboration of these levels is also uh, provided for by the information system entitled In the Protection of Our Children, which provides a common base of knowledge. After the terrible tragedy in Sun next to Dür, this, show, this shows uh, that our system is still not complete, still not comprehensive. We try to draw all possible conclusions also from this tragedy, and of course, nothing works uh, flawlessly, but we want this signaling system uh, and all the stakeholders who participate in child protection should know that um, what, what is happening in, in different cases and where intervention is needed in the interest of a child. Uh, even in the law of uh, pro in the act of procedural law, the uh, signaling obligation is also indicated, uh, and court is also of special responsibility here. Uh, leaving private law, I would like to say a couple of words about criminal law regulation because since 2010, um, our criminal policies, uh, very consequences 2010, also concentrates on the uh, child protection. Although it's not the uh, subject of today's conference, but we need to praise ourselves. Uh, we can't leave that to others. In the past 12 years, uh, the number of registered crimes, especially violent and uh, violent crimes in Hungary, decreased by 70 percent. And Hungary, thereby, is among one of the safest countries, not only in Europe but also in the world. And Poland is also in a similar state. Um, the ambassador is also here, uh, and I believe uh, crim criminal law usually is the one of the most conservative of legal fields. We did everything in order to be consequent in this regard. And as a result of our, of our consequent criminal policy, uh, the number of crimes decreased in Hungary by 70 percent. Um, and István Konya, uh, previous uh, vice president of the Supreme Court, uh, also uh, carries out a lot of awareness raising in this regard. This also uh, Pray, this praise is not only courts, but also, of course, law enforcement, police work. So back to family law. On the 1st of July 2013, the, first, the new criminal law came into force, and it offers enhanced protection to children. Um, and uh, crimes committed in the debt to the detriment of minors to 18 and 14 years are of highlighted importance. And several crimes, such as uh, traffic, uh, child uh, pornography, harassment, um, a highlighted case uh, becomes if uh, this person has been, uh, if this crime has been uh, committed by any kind of relative or any kind of person who has some sort of control over the minor. Another innovation of the Hungarian new criminal code is that the freedom of uh, sexual life, um, if uh, a sex crime, uh, if a sex crime has been committed um, uh, against a minor of 18 years, um, of less than 18 years, then this person can be banned from any kind of profession. Uh, 
and we can we can see how detailed uh, this act is. It tries to regulate almost each and every situation, every walk of life. The criminal code, of course, uh, contains several acts uh, in terms of physical uh, and uh, sexual abuse. And. Uh, which uh, comprehend basically every field of life again. Uh, the new code of uh, criminal procedure also highlighting the importance of the field um, addresses an very a, lo a lot of importance to this uh, to this aspect. And um, if a child has to be interrogated, this has to be carried out via means of telecommunication or via a child-friendly uh, room. COVID actually uh, promoted a lot in terms of the use of means of telecommunication in courtrooms. This is very widespread currently in Hungary. So these means, these technical devices are already given. Uh, a victim of uh, under 18 years can be confronted uh, with the perpetrator only with the minor's consent. And if the victim is a minor, um, a procedural act can be carried out only if uh, the um, only if the deed, the act does not can, cannot be um, acquired any other way. Uh, several other laws have been passed in Hungary, just to list some. Uh, the new regulation, so human trafficking and, and uh, child prostitution has been re-regulated and is more severe uh, currently. Um, in no conditional uh, liberty uh, can be granted if um, a crime is uh, to be punished with eight or more years and was committed against a person. And a non prescribable crimes uh, against minors and pedophile crimes are also regulated in a more severe way. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not wish to uh, drag it any longer because I believe this conference is about. Um, international and domestic experiences in terms of uh, legal uh, practices of child protection. I wish you all a happy uh, Christmas, happy new year, and a very good conference. Thank you very much for honoring uh, this institute with your presence. Thank you very much. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you at our conference on children's rights in theory and practice and international conference. It is a great honor to me that uh, uh, Dr. Judith Varka, Minister of Justice, who also supervises Ferenc Mada Institute of Comparative Law, is here with us today and is not only here with us today, but is also supporting has supported uh, the organization of this uh, co conference and this platform. Now, what is this platform? Uh, well, the organizers themselves represent uh, this kind of cooperation excellently, so that there is a central body, a government body. But, but beside that, there are different associations like the Institute of Comparative Law and the Association for Children's Rights are represented in this cooperation. And, and uh, the location for this conference, the venue, is here in this College of Theology of Religious Orders. So, uh, and from the point of view of the Convention on Children's Rights, the uh, Church ha played a very uh, uh, important role. So this symbolizes an excellent cooperation uh, uh, showing how important this issue is to all of us. I would like to draw your attention that before this international conference, uh, yesterday we had uh, an interdisciplinary day where also children were involved. Uh, there were separate round 
table discussions. We had children, uh, interviewers, uh, and you will soon see a short video about uh, yesterday's events. Our colleagues have worked on this uh, uh, till almost today morning. So about 300 children contributed with drawings and texts uh, to this event. Uh, a great thank you uh, for the opportunity. Now, today, uh, we, uh, at the center of our attention is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and we've heard a lot of inform important information yesterday and also today. Uh, and uh, now, uh, let me highlight a further aspect of this uh, convention. Ferenc Madel Institute of Comparative Law has as a main target that in Europe and in Central Europe, uh, the cooperation to, to support the cooperation of different scientific bodies. It is a great honor to us uh, that uh, we, we have uh, guests here uh, from neighboring countries on a very high level. Uh, so, uh, the uh, special thank you to the representatives of the different embassies uh, for their presence. Now, uh, Ferenc Smart Institute of Comparative Law uh, regards this cooperation as a very important one here in Central Europe. Now, all this in the light of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, well, uh, it's a, it's a convention that relates to many values that we regard as core values here in Central Europe. It is very well known that this UN convention is um, mainly is uh, um, almost the most universal convention. There is, so to say, just one country that did not adopt it. So it's very rare to have such a universally applying convention. Uh, in order to have such one, you need a strong concept behind it. You need lots of contributions uh, to finalize the text itself. And in this respect, for a central European country, Poland pay, pay, played an uh, extremely important role. Now, this whole concept uh, behind this convention, Janusz Korczak, uh, 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 Polish uh, doctor had this concept basically, who uh, during uh, the Second World War show had uh, uh, a huge company, and she and he was a main fighter for the rights of the child, and he is uh, he absolutely stood up for the rights of the children. He even accompanied them to the concentration camps, and he died as a martyr. But here, the story, the links, the, the contributions of Central Europe and of especially Poland to the birth of this convention do not end here because the first draft is connected to Tadeusz Pisinki, who was uh, uh, the family, who led the Family Matters uh, very group at the Poznan University. And for him, it was very important that the family should be in the center of child protection. This we heard very often also yesterday uh, from experts uh, that uh, the family has to be the first pillar of child protection. Tadeusz Misinski's uh, contribution is for this reason of utmost importance. However, it's not enough to have a concept or a first draft but it is also necessary to have others contributing to formulate into the tests. And uh, the Vatican played a crucial role in this. Uh, and it was uh, uh, John Paul II, so uh, the Polish Pope back then. So I believe that uh, the whole story of the creation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child shows that we here in Central Europe uh, have regard these values as of core importance. And we have to be, we should be proud of our contribution. At the same time, we should also feel the responsibility 
for this legacy and nurturing this legacy. I believe that uh, besides the other organizations, also Parents Mother uh, Institute could contribute to the creating of this uh, platform through the organization of uh, these days on the children's rights so that we can really contribute to the nurturing of this wonderful legacy. Uh, besides today, well, we will have the possibility, this, this platform where uh, NGOs, Hungarian and international uh, bodies and, of course, government uh, uh, bodies contributed that we can continue with this excellent cooperation. This is what I wish for us for the future. And if I can wish for something for Christmas, uh, then this would be my wish that we, we, uh, we shall be able to organize a similar conference next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to very warmly welcome you at uh, our event organized by Mother Ferenc, Ferenc Mother Institute of Comparative Law and uh, Association for Children's Rights. Uh, so at our conference, uh, International Conference. This event on children's rights is a really exemplary one and is a really unique one because besides uh, showing you a really comprehensive picture about the situation on an international level, level from the practical point of view and also from the theoretical point of view in an interdisciplinary way, at the same time, it, it, we are talking about a really unique event also because ch children are not only uh, uh, the, uh, the children also contributed uh, to the creation of this event, so it's not only about them. Um, uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child is a comprehensive international convention. Hungary also adopted it, and its main target is to uh, interpret and uh, uh, the, the protection of the a child and so to guarantee the, the children's protection, uh, their uh, participation and the caring for them. There are many rights connected to this, rights for the development, to social security, uh, to non-violence, protection against exploitation, uh, rights for the participation, uh, concerning uh, matters that relate to their lives. So uh, this convention is lots of facets, lots of aspects that I could list. Uh, however, as a lawyer and from the point of view of the issue, I, I, I know uh, the legislative background of, 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 of children's protection, but I'm not an precise expert on children's rights. However, I am a parent, I am a mother, and uh, also from this aspect, uh, of instinctively, uh, I uh, really closely follow uh, children's rights. And just as Minister referred to this, as children are growing, uh, their right for participation becomes uh, uh, more important and more adequate. So it's a bit like this issue is a bit like football. That means that everybody is some kind of an expert in the field, or at least uh, thinks he or she is an expert and thinks or she's competent and knows everything about this. So we are talking about a matter that is present in our everyday lives and that affects the whole society. So this is why 
we could ask the question is it is it good if we do this uh, instinctively can we do it just instinctively because all this affects the future generations children are extremely vulnerable uh, and so where the responsibility of the individuals and of the whole society is huge during several decades and now again a reference to the UN convention um, so the classical child protection areas have constantly developed the threats uh, have changed and have grown just think about uh, uh, the uh, uh, genital operations or online abuses and so on, but I could go on with this list. Besides protecting classical values, we also have to give answers to these new challenges. I myself, I'm very happy that uh, the topic of this conference uh, is uh, in, uh, so is uh, that here today there are several uh, experts from different domains. So it's an interdisciplinary event, and they can express their views on children's protection. So disseminating this information from experts can help us in moving from a. Uh, uh, being instinctive towards being really conscious. So this uh, work, creating value, uh, is is not only important to me as president of Ferenc Mali Institute of Comparative Law, but uh, also as a dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Miskolc. And uh, here I would like to announce you for the very announce to you for the very first time that the Faculty of Law of the University of Miskolc has a strategic goal to deal with children's issue as a core matter. And uh, from September 2023, uh, there will be uh, an international uh, uh, training uh, for uh, experts on health for uh, on the issue of children's protection. And for today, I wish you an excellent conference and thank you for your attention. Good morning, Madam Minister, Excellencies, colleagues. Um, such a wonderful opportunity to be with you today. I apologize for not being here yesterday, but I was happy to see the video and maybe also um, particularly happy to see the core message that came through um, that children have the right to be taken seriously and if I had to summarize the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and everything that came out of it I think it's that very core message that we have to acknowledge the children have rights and because they have rights they have the right to be taken seriously um, I have um, been invited to give you a more international perspective on international children's rights. Um, and that is all nice and wonderful, but of course children's rights really get meaning very close to where children live and where children grow up, where children play and where children engage with their parents and others, or where children are suffering or get into trouble or are not seen at all. So in order to, to give rights meaning, we have to have a good understanding of what rights are actually about. And I think that is my purpose of this morning in my talk, introducing the international perspective on children's rights, is to give you a bit of a better understanding of what we actually mean when we talk about international children's rights. I would like to start by taking you back to 1989. Um, not to give you a big historical perspective, but just to take you back one step. Because we are today, of course, very much concerned with children's rights in the 21st century. Um, but 
the framework that we use for children and children's rights stems for a com from a completely different time frame, the 1980s. In the 1980s, after the Poland, uh, Polish initiative, uh, the international community drafted the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and that resulted in a comprehensive international human rights instrument, embracing all kinds of aspects of children's lives and children's interests. But it was drafted in a time frame where children grew up in a different world. Children, for example, were not online. There was no interconnection between different generations like we see it today. And we were not so concerned, not yet at least, about climate change or the specific position of girls. Today we are talking about these issues, but the framework we use comes from a different time frame. On this slide, you see, see the UN, and they, you know, the UN is, of course, critical in uh, the uh, development, but also in the monitoring of international children's rights. But you also see this picture of the Berlin Wall, because in that particular time frame, there was also the end of the then Cold War. And, of course, be, coming from Hungary, I'm sure you know what I mean. But also, the, the drafting of the convention was very much influenced by the then international relations and the international relations have evolved over time. Um, and, and also that aspect is something to bear in mind all the time. But there was a reason to celebrate, because there was a Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, a human rights treaty for children across the globe. And it fundamentally changed the game. It fundamentally changed the way we look at children. And if I have to summarize that change, it comes down to three core messages. One is that children have rights, not because we like them to have rights or because we think they need rights. No, they have rights because they are human beings, like everyone else. You could say with the Convention on the Rights of a Child, children are seen as equal, as having rights like everyone else. But the second message is actually that children are a specific group of human beings, and the child does not exist. And you all know that a child that is just born is a completely different child compared to an adolescent. And in relation to that, children have needs, and some rights are specifically relevant to secure a harmonious, full development. Rights are, in that sense, supportive, and need to be supportive to that development. So that is uh, the second pillar under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, under international children's rights. And the third one is the child's relationship with her or his family. Children relate to parents, to others that are responsible for their upbringing, to the community they're living in, and we could summarize that and bring to, that together under the umbrella of the extended family. And international children's rights do not isolate children from their family, but they try to recognize that children relate to family members, and therefore their exercise of their rights is also somewhat related and dependent also on the role and responsibilities of, for example, parents. And this is an important point because sometimes family rights or parents' rights are seen as something that could be threatened by children's rights. But children's rights are not there to threat parental rights, they are there to harmonize the rights of both parents and children. But of course, if the child's rights are not adequately protected, the rights could give reason also to, to move aside the rights of parents. And that is, of course, a very... Um, uh, potentially um, uh, challenging dynamic. But I think we need to talk about it. This Convention on the Rights of a Child is there to be operationalized. It exists, but it needs to be enforced. And there is a whole set of actors involved. And of course, classically, we look at the state. For example, at the Minister of Justice, or at the Minister of Social Affairs or Education. That those departments are responsible for making children's rights real. 
our children grow up in societies where there is many actors involved and in one or the other way affecting their rights. And we are now, compared to 30 years ago, much more aware of the fact that all these actors, in a way, are duty bearers. So we are talking about both state and non-state actors who have a responsibility to make children's rights work. Think of the community and community actors. Think of schools, churches, hospitals, the justice system, family, and of course also parents. The Convention comes with many specific rights and provisions around the right to play and education, social security, health care, the rights of children with disabilities. But there are four core values that play a role regardless of the context we are talking about. So whether we are talking about family law or criminal justice or child protection or migration or the digital environment, these four core values matter. First, there is a critical role for the best interest of the child. The best interest of the child should be on, in our mind, it should be at the forefront of our thinking when it comes to children. But it should always be connected with rights. Because the big move that we have seen with this Convention on the Rights of the Child is that we are not long, no longer only talking about best interest of children, we are also talking about the rights of children. In other words, it is in the best interest of children to respect the rights of children. The right to preserve your identity, the right to know your origin, the right to relate to your parents, the right to be protected against violence. And that issue of the right to be protected against violence is the bridge to the next core value. And that is that the whole children's rights framework is built on the notion that children have the right to have their human dignity protected. And this sounds so obvious, but we ha are struggling with this. We are struggling with this, particularly in relation to the issue of violence. And I think everyone agrees that corporal punishment for children is a bad idea. That should not be in the, how in, the, in the schools, should not be in the workplace. But when it comes very close to the family environment, we become a bit uncomfortable. Is it really always bad to exclude violence from children's upbringing? That is a thought, of, that, is a, that, is a, that is a question that is relevant across the world. And there's many different answers to it, but international children's rights is very clear on this. It basically says no violence against children is allowed. No violence is justified. And all violence is preventable. There are other ways to raise children. There are other ways to take care of children. No violence, regardless of the context. And this is essentially about respect for human dignity. This is essentially about equivalence towards children as human beings. The third core value coming out of international children's rights, and many rights relate to this, particularly also the right to be protected against discrimination, is that we need to consider all children when we talk about children's rights. Not only our children, but also other children. Children that are refugees, children that are not visible in society, children that are marginalized, children that have disabilities. All children are human beings. All children matter. So the right to play is relevant for every child. The right to be heard is relevant for every child. And it's not the question whether a child has the right it's a question of how can we accommodate that right. For example, when a child has a disability. And the fourth core value is that children are actors. Actors in our societies, but most of all, of course, in their societies, in their communities. Children are there. They relate to parents, to community members, to peers, to teachers, to, uh, to the church, to the hospital. They engage. They are actors. And the rights are there to serve that existence of children in societies. So it comes with the right to participation, but it also comes with the acknowledgement that children evolve, evolve rapidly. And already as of a very young age, they may very well be capable of participating. And they do that on a daily basis. And they want to do that.
on a daily basis. This, what I just summarized, provides us with a universal narrative. And it was already referred to. There's only one country that has not ratified this framework. I'm not going to dwell on it. It's that one country in light blue. But all other countries have committed. Europe has committed. Hungary has committed. Poland has committed. Of course, because it initiated the whole framework. The Netherlands, my country, has committed. And this universal narrative is powerful. It's not everything. It's just a starting point. But wherever you are, in, regardless of the context of the, of the country, you can talk about these core values. Human dignity, best interests, all children, children as actors. And we have seen that that, that, that has had impact over the past 30 years. We have seen law reform, like the many examples the minister gave us this morning, we see that justice systems are much more child-friendly than before. We see that we have a growing body of jurisprudence, courts engaging with children's rights, making children's rights real in the context of education, in the context of climate, in the context of justice, in the context of family law. There is even judges writing child-friendly judgments, trying to capture their decisions in child-friendly language. We see a lot of civil society movement, 33 years ago, we would never have had a conference like this. We are talking about children's rights. We are doing research. We are teaching more and more and more. So this universal narrative, although it's not automatically accepted and understood by everyone, it gives us a common language. And so far, that has had significant impact. But the bigger question is, of course, how can we make sure that that framework that was developed in the 1980s is actually staying relevant in the 21st century? A, a century that is already very much different than the 20th century, and it's likely to become much more different along the way. Children are in the digital environment. How do we make sure that they are seen as actors and also get the protection they are entitled to? Children are, as we speak, affected by climate change and forced to relocate, to flee to another country. They suffer from hunger and lack of access to services because of climate change. It's not a future issue, it's a current issue. How do we make sure that we respect dignity, that we engage with children and that we protect all children in that particular context? We see that it is not only a question that adults are concerned with, Children themselves mobilize themselves around climate. They demand action. They force their way into the conversation. And they want the duty bearers, the states, to act. We are now today, as I mentioned before, much more talking about the role of the non-state actor. And that includes, for example, businesses. So what is the responsibility of businesses for the, for the protection of children's rights? Well, for example, in the context of the digital environment, we now know much better than before what we can expect from the big tech companies and the smaller agencies that are involved as well. But we've also seen in this relatively young century that we can be pushed back by a global pandemic, for example, really shocking us all, turning life upside down, moving children out of educational settings into the home where they may not be safe, where they may not have access to online uh, facilities to continue their education, where they cannot contact with their peers anymore, suffer from mental health impact. And these are only just a few examples of the impact of COVID. And we are still exploring what that impact could be and will be. Economic impact, mental impact, but also the, the number of children forced into marriage globally, for example, ha has risen again, has risen again, as, as a consequence. So this century has also showed us that we have to be ready for many challenges, including conflict not so far away from this country, including also the global migration that is, as we speak, very, very relevant and, and happening. 
And all these realities should, bring, should actually imply that we should constantly ask the question, how can we use this narrative to make sure that children are seen, that children are also getting the attention they need and are entitled to? And how can we make sure that we do that in such a way that we acknowledge them as actors, that we talk about all children, that we respect dignity, and that we put best interest of the child explicitly in our policies, laws, and other approaches. If we want to do that well, we have to work harder. We have to make sure that we address persistent challenges that exist in the way we actually ultimately try to implement children's rights. And it starts with the fact that we are working quite fragmentally. There is a Minister of Justice responsible for certain parts of children's rights. There is the Minister of Education having different responsibilities. There is a Ministry of Social Affairs, of Home Affairs, of Finances. How do we make sure that these ministries work together? How do we make sure that they know from each other what they are working on? How do we engage with the ministers, and who is actually responsible then? Where is the leadership in the departments? But the same can be said with regard to civil society. Civil society is fragmented too, so can we, can't we collaborate more and more comprehensively? Can't we better coordinate and collaborate? Can't foundations help us to bring streams together rather than to split them up and let people, civil society organizations, chase after money for certain issues alone? Research is important there. We have to collect data to show the efficacy of all our efforts. And don't get me wrong, we do a lot. But is it always so effective? I'm not so sure. We have to make sure that we really recognize children's rights. That we really give them the rights that they are entitled to. We like to talk about rights, but are we really serious about their rights? Particularly if the rights come so close to us that it makes life more difficult, more complex, more uncomfortable. I spoke to teachers two weeks ago in the Netherlands, and I spoke about child rights, and they, and they concluded, well, this means that we have to talk to children much more than we do. And I said, yes, I can't let make life more beautiful. Children's rights mean that children are part of the equation and you have to do more than you're used to do. So you have to be able and willing to share a bit of your authority. A third challenge that we have to overcome is that we really have to invest much more in participation of children. And that means that we have to explore together how we can make sure that this participation is meaningful. It's not about only about giving children a voice, but it's also about being accountable for what you do with that input. The right to be heard doesn't mean that you have to give children always um, what they want. It's, it's about taking them seriously in your decision-making. It's about clarifying what you did with the input of children. That's why it's quite interesting to see that judges are now experimenting with child-friendly language because it's essentially about the feedback that you give back to children in a way that they can understand. All right, yes. We have to invest more in monitoring. And I'm very glad to meet a Polish ombudsperson because that's a good example of an effective monitoring instrument at the domestic level. And I'm sure that there, there is mechanisms here as well, and in other uh, Central European countries there is many, and, but it's absolutely critical that we keep a close eye on monitoring, very close to where children live. So not only at the international level, very far away from the local realities, but also much more uh, closer. But I think we can win, and we can do that much better. And then the final key implementation that I would like to throw at you is that we have to talk about access to justice for children. We still come from a time frame where children were seen as dependent, vulnerable, maybe even the possession of parents and family. Children's rights take a different approach. They say children exist because they are human beings. 
And that means that they have to be part of the equation. It means that they have to be part of the conversation. Not because we want that or we love them or we like children. No, it's because they have the right to do so. But what does it mean in terms of children's access to remedies in, in case their rights are not taken seriously? And unfortunately, as we speak, children's rights are violated. And it will always happen. So what do we give children in order to really demand attention for their rights? And that vehicle is access to justice. And we are still struggling with this. We, are just, we have start, just started to explore what access to justice could mean for the educational environment, for the justice system, for migration, for um, uh, child protection. But it's definitely something we have to explore. Children have the right to access justice in case of rights violations. Now, with all my love, I would like to start. Yes, there it is. I will close with this. Children's rights are there. Children's rights are to be appreciated. And children's rights are there to be operationalized. Ultimately, the 21st century comes with new challenges and we have to make sure that we connect to these in order to really answer to the needs and rights of children in that particular reality. And that is a joint responsibility, not only of the state, but also of everyone else in society. It's easy to look to the state and say, you have to act. But it starts with what we, as a community, offer to children. The state comes in next. Children's rights have to be connected to the 21st century, including all children, and we should try to avoid that we leave children behind. Leaving children behind, of no child behind, is one of the core messages coming out of the international development agenda. And children's rights support that message. It is about all children and children as actors. And finally, we have to make sure that we are accountable. And one way of doing that is to secure that in case rights are violated, children have access to justice and can seek effective remedies to get better protection. With that, I would like to thank you all. I'm here all day to answer questions. If you have any, thank you very much for your attention. Over the floor to you, thank you. I would also like to thank you and very warm welcome, very hearty welcome to all the colleagues. <clears throat> and also to Ton Liefert for being able to meet online as well and and of course uh, teaching children's rights to professionals would be a key principle for everybody to get to know the key principles article 42 of the convention according to article 42 uh, of the convention states uh, state parties undertake uh, to uh, make all to make all principles and provisions of the convention widely known by appropriate and active, uh, and active means to adults and children alike and the means uh, the uh, the means are available uh, to the states uh, to carry out their five year report uh, and article 19g is uh, there to the state and the question is to the states whether there have any measures have been taken to make the convention and the optional protocols widely known to adults and children through awareness raising training and integration into school criteria so i believe that in a very highlighted way not only in the convention but also in the reporting obligation it can be seen that it is checked whether the uh, states uh, perform their duty so that everybody can get to know the convention and of course one condition would be for the professionals to know this <coughs> to interiorize it and to spread it why is this so important one very important question of course is that in order for the convention uh, to be known and to be applied not only <laughs> in terms of its uh, words, uh, what needs to be understood uh, is that everybody needs to understand and 
uh, and he needs to accept it and everybody dealing with children and if the wider public would also get to know and would accept and would understand what the convention is about the other very important thing is that we should have a common language everybody working as a professional everybody dealing with children's rights children and working with them which uh, uh, enables us to understand the very same thing by using the same uh, term and uh, the same uh, principles and the same practice because very often the practitioners of different fields have uh, some different approach to certain concepts. Of course, what would also help is uh, if uh, the uh, text of the CRC could also be produced in an adequate Hungarian language, because in the past 30 years this, not, this was not the case, uh, and because it also says... So there are also some interpretation issues in terms of uh, most important children's rights, which doesn't make the application of children's rights any easier. Another very important thing is that uh, public opinion, uh, children and parents should also know uh, the convention, not only its wording, but they also should also understand uh, and accept everything that Le Professor Leifard also talked uh, about, that every child has rights uh, from the moment of their birth, independently of where it was born and what condition it lives in. Uh, similarly, it is important um, for the experts to, uh, to sp the specialists to know uh, disagreements so that uh, children can know their own rights and thereby they can practice these rights and on a contrary way to public opinion which also always uh, takes obligation first, first when it comes to children children's rights enables the children to understand exactly that in order for them to carry out their rights this also means this also implies that they have to respect the rights of others children and adults alike, because everybody has rights. And uh, a child-friendly uh, language uh, would also be enabled, a language which is not only understood by professionals, by, but by laymen, parents, children alike. This, uh, and, uh, this means that the, the simplification of the professional language, making it widely understood, which would help us all a lot. So in order to understand professional language in, uh, in terms of uh, rights and obligations, because very often the involved parties, actors, stakeholders, simply parents, uh, children, etc., simply do not understand uh, the language of the law and the rights and obligations that this regulates. Uh, Queen's University of Belfast, uh, following a request of UNICEF, carried out a research uh, with the involvement of 26 countries on the uh, education of children's rights and how much this is part of school curriculum. If we take a look at the obligations and the reporting duties uh, in the convention, then it is sad to see that unfortunately, in spite of all good news in this regard, we do not have good news. Of, of the, the research carried out in the 26 countries shows that only 11 uh, includes, the, includes children's rights in the school curriculum, seven uh, partially uh, cover this, and 15 of the uh, research countries, there in 15 countries there is no mention of children's rights, which also shows that professionals dealing with children, especially teachers, um, do not really get preparation, do not really get help uh, in order to find out uh, about the methodology um, uh, to teach children's rights. The uh, summary of the research also shows that it is very hard to achieve the political support needed for the professionals and children to get to receive the adequate information which evidently does not only mean simply uh, transmitting information, but also interiorizing it. Uh, most uh, countries do not include such acts. No, there is no such legislation. Um, 
in order to make these rights widespread in the in the public even among children the research also showed that work carried out with teachers not only with teachers but with all the professionals who deal with children it would be important if their knowledge, if their motivation, their approach also has to be considered as a basis. Without changing this, we cannot achieve uh, respecting and understanding children's rights. This is why it is very important to apply this um, in, a in a comprehensive and complex way. And of course, they also need to be enforced in their role, which means that the children, that sorry that not the children the, the professionals are the, are the first one in uh, to understand and to apply children's rights it is also very important that uh, um, child education should not be a separate subject there are several uh, subjects and programs both in kindergarten and in school where uh, children's uh, education on children's rights could be integrated not to speak that if we are lucky it would be a basic part, a basic component of school and uh, kindergarten curriculum, not only of education, but of all kinds of behavior and work uh, regarding and affecting children. This should not be taught separately, but it would be organic part of work carried out in that school institute, which could be integ integrated in several other fields. It would also be important to see and to acknowledge that one of the impediments um, to the education of children's rights is that there are so many approaches, uh, very many um, find it uh, strange and uh, find it incompatible with their ideological approach because they find it too liberal. They find the convention much too permissive, much too lenient. In terms of beating children, as Professor Liefard also mentioned, there is serious debate in this regard. And similarly, the question is whether these, these rights are guaranteed to each and every born child, or should this be a link to a, to a certain condition uh, or to certain obligation? Because very often, school curricula is not linked to obligations, only to rights. A very exciting and interesting international initiative was carried out some years ago, which had as a target having electronic access to all the education material that is uh, used worldwide and universal uh, modules be prepared which in themselves or according to adaptation um, be used and a network be created a collaboration uh, be established which can uh, link all the everybody who wishes to provide training to professionals in children's rights uh, unfortunately, this international in initiative died, unfortunately, receiving no financing, no funding after 2015. Um, but um, these, efforts are, these efforts are still ongoing. Um, among them, uh, these efforts are also carried out by members of the uh, Children's on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, because the committee and the High Commissioner for Human Rights also supported very much this initiative. Some international and Hungarian practices I would like to very briefly talk. The uh, Council of Europe had a program uh, termed entitled Build, Building a Europe for and with Children in order to raise awareness and uh, their sphere of application. There's a new initiative, especially for jurists, lawyers, people dealing with law starting fr uh, from the 2022-2027 strategy. This is the so-called Help Human Rights Program, which, is, uh, which provides free online training to everybody who is interested in and especially focusing on jurists. Another very important initiative which uh, was luckily became very popular in Hungary too. This is the uh, small compass handbook on, on human rights education for children, uh, which, uh, which was first published in 2009 in Hungarian too. And in 2022, it's enlarged and newly translated version was also available. This can be downloaded 
uh, from the uh, youth uh, center platform of the Council of Europe. It was great to work on this because I believe this is one of the manuals which helps a lot, especially teachers and uh, um, social experts and all interested stakeholders uh, to raise awareness in terms of children's rights and they themselves can also acquire skill and experience with this regard. The European Union, which this March uh, ap approved uh, its strategy on children's rights and strives uh, to guarantee programs uh, in the framework of the uh, cooperation programs uh, by providing online training so that children's rights um, can be in the center um, in each and every initiative. And together with uh, UNICEF, it created, it established two uh, education modules which help uh, everybody participating in the collaboration program uh, to uh, put the children's rights in the center uh, while um, while monitoring and putting into practice children's rights. In terms of uh, international uh, training and inter internship, not not only due to the presence of my excellent colleague, Dr. Leifard, I included uh, the master program of Leiden University focusing on four fields. Uh, feminine children, migration, juvenile justice, and digital technologies, and this MA is available in English. It's an excellent program. Everybody can uh, apply to it. Similarly, the center training for in children's rights at the University of Geneva is also very interesting, and I would like to highlight the interdisciplinary introdu introduction to children's rights, <coughs> which is available for free. Uh, if somebody is interested, <coughs> that uh, doesn't need to be paid only uh, for only if somebody wants a degree, then a minimal quantity is to be paid to uh, to receive a, a written confirmation that he or she um, completed this course. But uh, but a summer course, summer university is also very interesting. Um, it's an inter interdisciplinary training called Children at the Heart of Human Rights. And this also provides a degree and further training. Um, the uh, social work department of the Babesh Boya University of Cluj Napoca also launched an MA program, which is part of the European Children's Rights MA network. It covers four semesters. It's very interesting, covering very interesting subjects uh, such as research, methodology, field work, in order to enable that. Um, professionals dealing with children's rights uh, work in this field. Uh, the University of Strathclyde, um, Glasgow, uh, also provides a six-week uh, free training under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, King's College, and uh, the mentioned Queen's University of Belfast also provide excellent courses. I included some American programs as well just to show that the United States signed but did not ratify this, this agreement. This has uh, several uh, reasons not to be discussed here, but the children's rights movement in the U.S. is very strong, which although the agreement has not been ratified, that its application is found to be important. Harvard, Columbia, and other uh, famous universities provide excellent training to professionals. Uh, in order to raise awareness in terms of, of, uh, of children's rights and, of course, the University of Australia, which also uh, ratified this agreement. And very briefly about Hungarian training, I also teach at, uh, at uh, uh, further training where, we, uh, where this course is very, pop <coughs> very popular and very exciting. Uh, it is very exciting to see all the colleagues working in the field, especially jurists, but also social experts who uh, have all sorts of exper uh, experience and can provide feedback uh, in terms of the usefulness if children's rights was included in primary education. Unfortunately, this is not the case currently in Hungarian universities. Not your name, said we. There is a very popular program of UNICEF called Alarm Glock, which is for social workers, teachers, and other volunteers. 
uh, uh, so trained to teach children then later on uh, um, in school environments. Then there is also a training of child children's rights for uh, for uh, other experts, and there is a SOS Children's Villages Foundation um, in eight countries. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was a training introduced for child protection experts. It's an EU-wide program uh, for around 800 professionals. Uh, then uh, concerning uh, digital rights for professionals, there is the so-called Hintalovon Foundation uh, providing training. And uh, we also have an EU-funded training program called You Have the Right. It is a program for children, parents, and professionals. Um, it, we, have, we can provide lots of educational aids and training courses, and we managed to publicate a handbook on the application of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's a handbook of around 1,000 pages. Uh, it was published in Hungarian, but it would be excellent to republish it uh, uh, again. Now, what is the, the aim of training professionals? Well, firstly, uh, that they know and apply the principles of the Convention and the obligations of the state to adults, because very often uh, this is missing. So it seems as even if the knowledge uh, would be there, it seems that the knowledge about the obligations uh, is, is missing uh, uh, among the adults. It would also be important uh, uh, that uh, professionals make children aware of their rights and help them exercise them. And of course, knowledge sharing as wide as possible with communities, politicians and policymakers, uh, um, the media where there is lots of false uh, information and misconcepts uh, going on so that everyone is aware of, and, uh, of the child rights approach and children's rights uh, programs. Uh, um, in, in practical implementation. Now, what do we want to uh, achieve? Uh, we want to achieve that everyone be accountable and responsible for ensuring the application of uh, rights of the child in all countries, respecting and taking seriously the principles of ensuring the right to non-discrimination and so on. What uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Liefard already mentioned, uh, we want to ensure the right to a non-discriminatory, inclusive quality life. Um, uh, so this is uh, a development and identity from the three Ps. This is the promotion. Uh, we want to provide protection from all forms of abuse, violence, abuse, uh, torture, and intimidation. This is the protection pillar. And we want to ensure children's rights to participate as equal citizens, to express their views, and to have them taken into account in all matters that concern them. This is the third pillar, participation. And there is a fourth one, which is important, though, unfortunately, very often due to the false interpretation, false translation, there is a lots of misconceptions around this. So considering the best, the most important interest of children in all decisions, and now we'd like to do the attention to decision makers, best interest in the convention is in the plural, so just not one, uh, the children can have not only have one interest, but several interests. Now, what are the challenges that we face? Children know their rights and can exercise them if we, adults who are around them, also know our rights and the rights of the children. If adults feel that they cannot exercise their own rights, if they are not aware of their own rights, or if uh, they think that these rights are not there for everyone, uh, then it follows that they do not recognize and respect the rights of the children either. Children learn and follow the pattern what they see and experience from the behavior, lifestyle, and reactions of the adults around them, and not from 
uh, what we tell them. So this is why it is of paramount importance that they see and perceive that adults respect themselves and others, that they know and respect human rights and children's rights. And this would be the best form of transferring knowledge and skills. Thank you very much for your attention.